Hey there, John. Uh, John McGuire, how you doing? How you doing, John? It's been a long time, John. We are part two of the Glenn and John conversation about whatever we were talking about in part one. Uh, welcome to the yeah. Glenn Show, John. Thank you, Glenn. Good to be here. Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv. Uh, coming from the Watson Institute um, for International and Public Affairs at Brown University, with which I am affiliated, talking to John McWhorter of Columbia University, uh, where he is a professor, teaches humanities, linguistics, philosophy, and various other such things. Uh, we have an ongoing conversation here about many things, including, uh, importantly, about the political and cultural debates surrounding race uh, issues in America, and we are continuing. What was part one, John? I, I'm, it's been so long now, I barely remember. Well, to tell you the truth, what we should do now, because where we left it last time, we kind of had some momentum. We need to talk about what I call Starbucks in the swimming pool which is that you and I are talking about how people exaggerate about racism and its effects. But the smackdown point from, you know, the, the anti-racism crowd, you know, the, pe the good people, as they think of themselves. Starbucks it's the, in the swimming pool, okay. The good is people. that to be black is to suffer endless encounters, such as being asked to leave a Starbucks when you were just waiting for a friend and you weren't buying coffee. And, and, the, and viewers and listeners, by the way, I know that when I mention Starbucks, I know from I wrote a piece on it and from Twitter, I see that there seems to be a controversy over whether or not those guys were actually staging some sort of political protest. In the response to this, I hope we won't get stuck in that groove, because even if that's what was going on at Starbucks, that was just one case. Because in general, there are all sorts of things that happen, especially in the summer when swimming pools are involved, where black men and black kids in particular are asked to leave swimming pools for no reason other than that somebody thought they were suspicious because they had brown skin. Okay. Every week the media re re reports something like this. And a lot of people think you and me are fools because of things like that. And I think we need to have a response. We can't make it look like we don't know those things happen. So what do you think about Starbucks in the swimming pool? Okay. So uh, let me say what I think about what you're saying about Starbucks in the swimming pool. And then I'll say what I think about Starbucks in the swimming pool. I, that's your shorthand for uh, these a period of incidents, barbecuing while black or barbecue Becky, who uh, right. calls the cops on some guy who doesn't have a permit to burn charcoal near a lake or something. something. Right. Um, uh, a, a student at a university who is questioned about uh, whether or not she has ID to belong there because someone has seen her and suspected that she didn't belong there. That The burdens Every of week. being black as reflected in all of these various microaggressive and some of them not so microaggressive incidents. And I exactly. think what you're saying about this phenomenon, and there is a story every day or every week to this effect, is it potentially makes you and I look like fools uh, to the extent that we are this uh, contrarian kind of uh, counter-narrative uh, uh, source of uh, commentary on race matters where we're saying uh, people's claims about racism are overblown, there's too much time spent worrying about these uh, microaggressive acts uh, and so forth, that racism is never going to be completely eliminated, but it's been substantially reduced and that black people need to get on with stopping the belly aching. If that's our line and Starbucks is happening, that makes us look like fools and you want to clear the air. Do I get that correct? That is precisely it. Okay, now fools? let me comment on that. Because a person who didn't know you as well as I do and uh, therefore was not as sure as I am of your integrity might think that this was a pose that you were adopting in order to try to maintain your reputation within, well, you live in New York City and I don't. Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Within a yes. certain social and political circle, you, the last thing you want to be thought of is one of these knucklehead, know-nothing black conservatives who's just spouting the Trump-friendly line of, uh, you know, anti-Black Lives Matter. And so you want mm -hmm. to spend a whole show talking about how Starbucks is real, how these microaggressive acts actually happen, how we are woke, not asleep, we woke over here. We, the brothers, the black guys at bloggingheads.tv are actually woke, we know what it's all about. And uh, you know, you're, you're kind of, uh, from my point of view, maybe this is feeding the beast. Maybe efforts to placate these people will ultimately be in vain because as soon as you come out against affirmative action, it's over. 
As soon as you mm -hmm. say that a police shooting like the one recently in Chicago where the cops shot a man who was on the video apparently armed with a weapon at his back and with his hand seeming to be reaching for the weapon, he was walking away from the cops toward the street and he got shot in the back by the cops when it looked like he was reaching for a weapon and there were protests. And as soon as you and I say, well, maybe it wasn't a bad shooting, as soon as we invoke someone like Peter Moskos, the criminologist at John Jay College who uh, is a liberal politically, but is also a guy who has some sympathy for the cops. All bets are going to be off. As soon as an interstate gets shut down by protesters who are uh, complaining about the fact that the city can't make black on black murders go away in Chicago and they're going to have a political protest because the murders only take place in certain neighborhoods and not in others. And we criticize, or I criticize uh, that activity no matter how much placating, no matter how many incidents that you say, yeah, 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 I know it's real, you're still going to be in the doghouse. So uh, what do you say about that, John? I, I say you're trying to split the difference with the devil, and it's a losing proposition. It's interesting you, you say that. I, <laughs> I'm not trying to placate because um, that kind of placating doesn't work. What I'm trying to show is that our views still make sense despite – Starbucks. And once again, folks, I'm using Starbucks just as a stand in, even if that episode has certain contours. I mean, the general aspect of these things that happen all the time, not just what happened in Starbucks one afternoon, but I'm going to keep calling it Starbucks. OK, the um, anyway, uh, it's not it, it's not that it's that I want I want us to defend ourselves and I want people to not think that we don't know, because it's surprising how cartoonish the view of people like us can be among even intelligent people. A lot of people will actually think that we don't know about those things. They think that somehow we don't read the paper or that we're in some kind of denial. And I don't think either one of us are. Now about the play placating, I've learned over the years, there's a, there's a certain contingent where my analogy with them is they're like a spinning blade. It's like you're in a sawmill and there's that blade coming that's gonna cut the log. And, and you, come, you come near those people, you try to be nice, you try to meet them halfway, and you just get sawed to pieces. They hate you and there's just nothing to be done. Right. So for example, you know, I don't think that we're gonna make any impression on, you know, a certain kind of black college professor who listens to people like us and just harumps and pulls at their collar and just can't stand the attention that we get. We will never reach that person. We will never reach, I'm gonna do another cartoon character, a certain kind of person with an NPR mug and a man bun who is just, you know, Utterly convinced that you know Mike Brown and Ferguson and the way people looked at it five years ago is the black condition. We will not reach that guy. But I do think, in contrast to some of the things I've been saying over the past couple of years, I'm beginning to realize, and this is not just because of this dark web thing that we seem to, you know, my mentioning that seems to have gotten more attention than I thought it would from that people interested in that contingent. There's some people who understand what we're saying. I think that we're entering a time, I think it happened about a year ago, when there's beginning to be a pushback against the extreme, against the buzzsaw people. There's something happening, there's something in the air. And I think that there are more people now who are willing to at least hear us out than there were 10 or 15 years ago. So I just want, I want to try to reach those people, but those people want to know, do you know about Starbucks and the swimming pool? Because that's what they read every week. So we have to make sure that we have a position there because very reasonable okay. people will actually think, I'm almost done. They'll no, think no, no, take your time. They need, they need to sit us down and carefully explain that black people suffer microaggressions. Have you heard about? And they'll genuinely think we don't know. And so to keep ahead of that and to make people realize that you can have our views without being naive, we have to talk about Starbucks. What do you think about that? You know, there's a, that, that professor. Well, no, that we're not going to get to that professor. But the more reasonable person. What about that? Well, I mean, since you've invited the conversation, I can say this much for my own account. Um, I know about Starbucks. I experienced the Starbucks phenomenon on a regular basis. I mean, I can tell you about having been invited to be the keynote speaker at a conference in Washington, D.C., arriving on a very hot summer day with my suit and tie on, but perspiring, finally getting to the top floor of a tall conference building, you know, office building in D.C., where the conference was taking place, uh, walking off the elevator, uh, I happened to be with a white guy who was also on the elevator, and the greeter, the woman whose job was to greet the dignitaries as we arrive at the conference, comes up to the white guy and takes care of him. 
Make sure that he's got his badge. Shows him where the lavatory is so that he can freshen up. And looks at me as if I wasn't even standing there. And I have to remind her of who I am, the keynote speaker, perspiring in my collar getting damp. I desperately need to be directed to the men's room. I need a towel. I need a bottle of water. I need a chair to sit on. And I have to remind her because what does she think I am? I'm the right. I'm the delivery boy. Okay. And that is what she thinks. I mean, that happened to me. I can tell you that my wife and I, and this was recently, we, uh, my lovely wife, Lawan, uh, we were in New Orleans. This was six months ago, less than six months ago. We wanted a po' boy. Okay. You know, we're in New Orleans. You want a really good po' boy. We got uh, directed to an excellent po' boy place and we got there. It was about one o'clock in the afternoon and they had already sold out and they had no fresh bread. So they couldn't serve us a po' boy. But they advised us that two blocks down and three blocks over was an excellent but unknown little place that had the best po' boys in New Orleans, except for the place to which we had been directed. Shouldn't we check it out? So we walk over there. So we get into this establishment, which is basically a bar with a window seating thing uh, along uh, one side of the, of the long, narrow room. And I can pick. it looks like a neighborhood establishment and there are people sitting at the bar and they're eating and they're drinking and there's a bartender and he's glad handing and he's laughing. And we take a seat by the window, not at the bar. My wife goes over and asks for a menu and the guy says, I'll be with you in a moment. So we go back and we sit at the window. Meanwhile, people are coming in and out. They're getting served. Food's coming from the kitchen. Drinks are being had. Laughter. The bartender slapping people on the back. He never comes with the menu, John. We sit there for five minutes, for 10 minutes, for 15 minutes, okay, until we determine that he's not going to serve us. We'll be damned if we're going to ask again for service. We call ourselves an Uber, and we make our way back to the hotel from which we are directed to what turned out to be an absolute knock-dead uh, po' boy place uh, in the quarter, and that uh, we had a decent meal, although an hour and a half later than what we had anticipated. Uh, those are stories I can tell. Perhaps there are other stories, but hey, I know that, you know, uh, shit like this happens in America to black people. It, it happens all the time. So, OK, I don't know. I don't think that's going to earn me any uh, standing <laughs> with anybody out there. Uh, but I can at least give that testimony. Well, how about how about this? A lot of people think they'll say it outright sometimes and you can feel it in the thread of the general race conversation today. A lot of people think that because those things happen, and I can match you story for story on those things. I'm sure. That that's why we cannot be evaluated the same way when it comes to serious academic competition. That that sort of thing, you know, one nick after another, death by a thousand cuts, is why you have to give black people a break on taking tests or making top grades. That sort of thing is why there need to be reparations for slavery, Jim Crow, and even you know, the present tense, that's you know the reparations argument. Many people would say that things like that are why to be a good white person, you're supposed to walk around thinking of yourself as privileged and as black people, as people who are not privileged, et cetera. A lot of it is that. And so if you say racism, what is racism today? What most people first think of is the cops. But if you're talking about somebody who doesn't have encounters with the cops, which I never have really, and I gather you haven't, or certainly not recently. Exactly. Then the other thing is these, what we now call microaggressions. And the idea is that we go through this all the time. I have people on social media, some of them quite close to me, who claim that as black people, they go through this sort of thing every day. Frankly, I think they're exaggerating. However, they think of it as something that is just a constant aspect of living. And my position on this is no, those things do not justify policies that treat black people like children. Yes, there is Starbucks in the swimming pool. I can talk about things like that, not specifically, but those things happen to me two or three times a year. But they have nothing to do with whether or not black people should be expected to X, Y, or Z. That is my feeling, that I don't want those things to make it seem as if we're poster children. And I think that that's what a lot of people read it as. They think, well, if they have to go through that, then certainly young black men are allowed to not be as civil as other people, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that that's not true. I think that frankly, it's at the point where being a black person in the United States, and I'm not talking about being shot, but if we're talking about these things like Starbucks in the swimming pool, I would rather undergo Starbucks in the swimming pool three times a year than be white and weigh 400 pounds. Sincerely, I know people who are extremely obese. 
they have much harder lives on the basis of their weight than I have on the basis of my color. That would not have been the case 100 years ago. I would rather be myself than have severe acne, you know, and therefore, you know, it'd be hard to get together with anybody. People look at you funny. You know, in general, you wouldn't get promoted as much because you don't look good. I would much rather be black than have serious acne. I wouldn't have said that 100 years ago. And so I want people to understand that, that those things do happen, but they do not justify the sorts of things that you and I complain about. They're two separate things. See what I mean? I do. I, 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 I see you making two points. One of them is that most of the microaggressive stuff is not that bad when you consider what kinds of uh, maladies can befall a person in life. And the other thing that you're saying is notwithstanding the fact that these things happen as bad as they may be, uh, they don't obviate the larger points about uh, the sort of ex existential imperative of African Americans taking responsibility for our own lives, being alert not to be reduced to a status of dependency, not to be presumed constantly to need the sympathetic response of woke, uh, uh, liberal white allies, uh, not to be judged by a different standard if the judgment is affirmative action, not to be uh, subjected to the soft bigotry of low expectations where you write a piece and it's really a bad piece, but everybody tells you it's an okay piece because you're a black guy and they don't want to hurt your feelings. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to have to bear that uh, as a response to uh, what you're calling Starbucks in the swimming pool. So those things happen. Starbucks in the swimming pool happen. They are real microaggressions and maybe even more than micro happen in America. But uh, they are A, not so bad all things considered, count our blessings, and B, um, no good reason to lapse into a position of dependency with one's hand out demanding reparations all the time and being angry at the world because you're black. Am I reading you correctly? I think that's what you say. That's pretty much it. I'm not necessarily going to say it's not that bad because people will differ in, in terms yeah. of what they feel is bad, but it's not as bad as a great many other things that could befall a human being. And in general, I think that we tend to forget when we talk about race alone that to be human is to be resilient. If we're talking about things like the swimming pool, as ugly as that would be that day, that cannot be something upon which we judge how strong a person is going to be throughout their lives. Even if it happens, you know, a couple times a year, it's not enough. That's not what true suffering is. I think that there's a, we've extended the Jim Crow model to what today are just things where you scrape it off of your shoe. And so, yes, that, that, that is it. I don't want people to read about that sort of thing every week and, you know, kind of smack the table and say, well, there it goes. You know, remember Larry Bobo, you know, ain't no post-racial in America after the thing happened to Henry Louis Gates on the porch. No, no, I, I don't want that. It's not, those things do not disprove things that you and me have been saying. They happen alongside those things. And I think anybody who denies it doesn't know that they're being racist. They're calling black people inherently weak. You know, a lot of people who've had trouble in their lives, you know, whites in particular, will then hear about somebody who's asked to leave a pool because they're wearing socks by the police, which is a nasty thing to happen that afternoon. And they'll think, well, that hobbles the black race completely in being able to achieve anything. That's well, condescending. Let me observe something here, John. I think you have your finger on something that's, that's really important and that has historical resonance. Uh, if I don't uh, mistakenly recall this, I think in the majority opinion in Plessy v. Ferguson, that's the case that upholds racial discrimination as consistent with the 14th Amendment, 1896, if I'm not mistaken. There's something in that majority opinion which says uh, that if uh, the plaintiff uh, bringing the case of being discriminated against because he was black uh, 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 believes that that was the case, then that's because he elects to put that construction on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not quoting it exactly, but this could be looked up. And the general tenor of the rejection of the black man's uh, uh, claim is that that's not racial discrimination unless you choose to put that construction on it. It doesn't devalue as a black person unless you choose to put that construction on it. So mm -hmm. it puts it into the subjective realm of how the uh, complainant is experiencing the experience. In other words, they're assuming that it's a devaluation of them because of their race, but it need not be so. That's an assumption in their part. Uh, the, the, the doll experiments, uh, Kenneth and Mamie Clark, remember from the uh, Brown decision, 50. social yeah. psychology evidence that was brought to bear, uh, separate is inherently unequal. This is the anti-legal, uh, uh, anti-thesis to the Plessy decision, right? It, 
It says, if it's separate, it can't possibly be equal because the fact of separation inherently devalues the person of the African-American. Now, there are many people who take issue with that. Uh, Clarence Thomas is one of them who say, no, no, that I'm not in school with a black person doesn't mean that I am with a white person doesn't mean that I am less than uh, segregated institutions are not inherently devaluing. And again, it becomes subjective. It becomes what people construe it. Now, now let's fast forward to the present day. I get a surly uh, attendant at the uh, airline counter. I, I get a waiter who's not as polite as I want him to be. I get a cop who doesn't say sir or ma'am when he demands to see my license. I'm black and that happens. Let's suppose the people on the other side of these transactions are white. Now, I might just write that off as, okay, I'm dealing with an asshole, one in every 10 person that I'm going to encounter in life is an asshole. Uh, let me just uh, grin and bear it. Uh, I might say, this guy got up on the wrong side of the bed this morning. No matter who was sitting behind the wheel when he comes up to ask for the license, he was likely not to be polite because he got up on the wrong side of the bed. His wife didn't treat him the way he wanted to be treated last night, whatever. Uh, and that's just uh, one of the ebb and flow of life. Whoever said that life was going to be free of, quote, microaggressions. I mean, it's just I don't have to attribute it to my blackness. I don't have to go around with my fist balled up, with myself in a knot ready to be transgressed so that I can be furious about it. I don't have to be angry all the time. I can put a different construction on it. Um, cops shoot white people who are unarmed, running away from them with their hands in the air. That happens. It probably happens numerically more often than it happens to black people, although proportionately it'll happen more frequently to blacks. But every time one of these shootings happens, it doesn't have to be interpreted as yet another instance of white supremacy, uh, you know, mucking with uh, the, the lives of black people. It can be understood differently. And it, there's a certain degree of choice, a certain latitude of choice in that. So that's one of the things that I want to say. I want to say one more thing and I'll stop. I know I'm going on for a bit. Sometimes some of this stuff that we interpret to be microaggressive is rational behavior on the part of people who are responding to the reality. Okay, the reality, for example, of carjacking, carjacking in Chicago, Baltimore, whatever. You know what I'm saying? You're at a service station, you're low on gas, it's 1.30 in the morning, a car pulls up, and it's got uh, three black teenagers in it, okay? And you're frightened. You're fiddling with the gas pump. You're trying to get into your car and, and, and drive away because you're afraid that someone's going to get out with a pistol stick it in your face and take your BMW from you. You're afraid of that. Now, you don't do that when it's a, a middle-aged white woman that's in the car, but you do do it when there are black teenagers in the car. Someone is observing you at another pump. Look at all those people getting flustered just because some black teenagers came up and they accused them of being racist. When in fact, fear of being jacked at 1.30 in the morning in certain neighborhoods and certain cities and running away from kids who are 18 to 22 years old who look like they've been smoking weed, maybe you can smell the weed coming out of the car, is a completely rational uh, behavior. Now, people want to talk about the uh, microaggressive behavior. They never want to talk about the underlying factual predicates that might be motivating the microaggressive behavior. They never want to talk about the racial despair. I see someone at 2 o'clock in the morning in the dormitory lounge who I don't recognize as being a, a student there. I'm in uh, New Haven, Connecticut, or Providence, Rhode Island, or Hyde Park, Chicago, Illinois, okay, where I have uh, major elite universities located cheek by jowl with uh, large low-income African-American communities. I ask the person for an ID. I call security. Now, this is terrible to the person who has legitimate standing to be there and who then has to be hassled. Is the behavior of wondering who it is that's sitting in the dorm lounge at 2.30 in the morning, whom I don't recognize, who's an African-American, is the behavior of wondering whether or not that person is authorized to be there really such a terrible thing, given the predicate that, in fact, I'm in an environment in which uh, incidents happen, people's purses and laptops go missing, uh, uh, community people who do not have authorization and who are bent on no good are, in fact, a menace in the uh, particular environment? Brown University has stopped reporting the racial identity of people who are assailants in the incidents that happen regularly around here 
where people get robbed, their cell phones or wallets get taken from them. A knife gets pulled on them and their stuff is demanded. That happens here in Providence, Rhode Island routinely, several times a year for sure. In the past, they used to issue announcements in which they would say, incident happened on Fair and Meeting Street, 1.30 a.m., student approach, assailant was wearing a brown jacket, appeared to be African-American, was five foot 10 inches tall, looked to be about 30 years old. Now they omit the racial information, okay? Because they don't want to foster stereotypes. How foolish, in my opinion, A, because it negates largely the effectiveness of the announcement, you have deprived the community of the information they need to actually identify the person, and B, because it invites people to fill in the blank. You didn't tell me who it was, so now I have to assume. Sometimes it's a white guy, but if you don't tell me who it is, and I'm in Providence, Rhode Island, I'm likely to assume it's a Latino or a black person uh, Mm -hmm. rather than the white person if you don't give me the full information. But I I don't know this for a fact, but I would bet a lot that the administration decided to change the protocol for reporting these incidents because it doesn't want to come under pressure from activists in the student community who say that identifying these assailants by race is fostering a, quote, false, quote, narrative. Well, the narrative isn't false. The, The narrative being most of the time the people who do these acts are persons of color in this particular environment isn't a false narrative. It's an unfortunate narrative. It's a narrative to which one can adduce explanations and historical and whatnot. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm not unmindful of all of that, but uh, it also has to be a fact. Yeah. You know, it's, it comes down to the religion again. There's a religious scripture that all these people are working from. And one of the tenets, one of, on, you know, one of, the, one of the strokes of this religion is that white people must be constantly accused of being racist on the basis of nothing but a pure animus against a dark-skinned other. There being no other reason, it has nothing to do with experience, there aren't in-betweens, there aren't gray zones. There has to be this primitive racism of the kind that a European had when encountering an African in 1550. And the idea is that that is still with us, this utterly senseless, xenophobic bigotry. And therefore, you're not supposed to talk about the fact that if a student is you know, sleeping in the lounge at one of those schools, which is next door to a lower class black community, that even if it technically isn't fair, like ultimately it isn't fair that that person gets asked who she is. I would say either probably somebody watching someone like that, as long as they're not doing anything, should let them alone unless they're doing something. Still, if the person asks, it's not because that person had brown skin and is a bigot. It's more complicated than that because of whatever the crime patterns are in the community and who does commit most of the crimes. But you're supposed to turn away from that. What scares me is that, you know, you talk about the kind of person who says they suffer racism every day. I have no doubt that the people who are like that are the ones who are making the kind of error that you're talking about, where any time they deal with a white person who is less than sunny, they just assume that it's because of the color of their skin and they know people who will support them in that. When the fact is that you can't know, and definitely in 2018, a great many of those encounters are just one person with another. And what worries me is that if you try to talk about that sort of thing, or if you try to talk about the fact that more white people are killed for no reason by the cops than black, never mind the proportions, more white people are, people clutch, they clench up. They feel like you're taking something away from them. They don't want to hear what you might think of as the good news. If you tell a person, do you realize that sometimes if the person at the 7-Eleven doesn't smile at you, it's not because you're black. It's because they don't like working at 7-Eleven. And if you watch the camera, they don't smile at anybody. They wouldn't want to hear it. What they're thinking is, no, wait, there is racism against me and I've got to show it. I've got to hold on to this. It's become part of the whole racial identity. And now that's mirrored outward into being white people's identity as good people to pretend to agree with it. And yeah, that's, that's scary. It, it'd be interesting. Well, a lot of the people I know who say, I suffer racism every day, I would love to have a camera just follow them throughout every day, except when they're in the bathroom or asleep for just a week and see what they're thinking of as racism every day. And I'm sure that you could possibly, in a given week, eliminate every single encounter they thought of that way as being truly racist. If you follow them for a year, you'd find about three things of the sorts of things you and I are talking about, if that. But, you know, nobody would ever fund or do (laughs) that 
experiment, or they would only do it in order to show that the person was being victimized. And what's interesting is that then they would write a paper about it, written in narrative form, the whole critical race theory idea that stories are truth. And this, by a certain contingent, would be elevated as getting at the truth, whereas if it's somebody like you or me or Sowell or Steele, then when we tell stories, they're just anecdotes. They're not, they're not representative. Whereas the other side can tell stories. I've seen whole academic articles that are stories of young black men talking about bad times they had with the cops. Purely stories written by serious people that got passed. Whereas nobody who was taking the other view would ever get past, you know, referees in a sociology journal of that kind. So yeah, we've got a really crabbed kind of conversation, but I think people are beginning to see through it. And it, it makes me happy that the truth is at least shining through the clouds in a way that it um, wasn't before. My last thing on this is, is this. I feel when I am microaggressed in that way, superior. And I think in that I am not arrogant, I'm normal. And so when I, about last year sometime, maybe it was this year, I was getting a cortisone shot for my shoulder. And the receptionist, I'd call her about 32, white woman, waited on one and a half white men ahead of me and just, you know, did what it had to do. And then they go off into the waiting room. Then I'm standing there. Now, I wasn't in a suit. So I guess maybe if I'd been in a suit, it would have been different. I was dressed about the way I'm dressed now and I'm standing there. And she just looks down and starts shuffling through her papers. And she clearly wasn't going to do anything for me. And I said, um, miss, I'm here for an appointment. And she said, oh, and then looks up and takes care of me. But why did she look down? Why was she so finished with me? She thought I was some kind of handyman. And the reason she thought I was a handyman is because I'm black, certainly. Now, did I think of that as hurtful? No. Frankly, I'm pretty sure that if I were a receptionist, I wouldn't have made that mistake. I would not have seen a casually dressed black man and assumed that he was there to mop the floor or deliver something, especially you know, if he's just standing there looking at me. I wouldn't have done that. So frankly, I feel superior. That didn't hurt me. And I think that's a perfectly natural response that intelligent black people are trained to work against. Black people are trained to pretend to be hurt by things like that. You why would I let, you why would I let that because, woman? Because you're not a receptionist, you're a college professor? No, no, not, none of that. I feel superior because I wouldn't make that biased mistake. You know, I frankly, I'm a better anti-racist than her. I see. She looks at me and gives into this impulse thinking, oh, well, black people are delivery men, which let's face it, most of the ones that she knows probably are. Talk about the, the gray zones. It's not that she's a Klansman, but she made a very quick generalization and she wasn't checking herself for it. And that's a weakness on her part. So if she does that to me, I don't feel denigrated. I'm now, is a little of it that I'm a little older and that, frankly, I'm a professor and she's a receptionist? Probably that's a little bit of it. But if another professor did something like that to me, still, I think, no, I've got one over on you because I wouldn't have made this mistake. Anybody would feel that way. But instead, we're trained to say that it hurt us. Whereas, frankly, that would not be true of anybody with a normal amount of human competence, well, I feel. Let, let me unpack this train to train to. I've been thinking about this for a while uh, because I think there's a deeper point here. Uh, there are narratives and then there are facts or evidence. Okay. Mm -hmm. So a narrative is a, a master narrative. It's a story. It, it's a, it's an account. Uh, in the case of race in America in the 21st century, the narrative from uh, the usual suspects on the left, the social justice warriors, the anti-racism crowd, is one of the constant uh, victimization of African Americans in ways large and small by systemic and by idiosyncratic forces. Constant repression, uh, the fact that uh, I saw a piece just today, I think it was in the Daily Beast or Huffington Post, um, uh, she, the, the writer, I wish I could remember her name, says uh, one of James Baldwin's favorite lines for her is, if you're black in America, uh, you have to get used to being angry all the time. And she was saying she's angry all the time. She's a writer. And she goes on to describe an incident in a bookstore where her book is on sale along with other books. And she and a friend are in there sprawling in the back uh, of the aisles of the bookstore with open books on the floor as they go through them. And the manager comes over and instructs them that they need to go and sit on the area that's designated for people to see and read books and not be sprawled on the floor. And she's going to make a whole big deal about that. There's a master narrative. The master narrative is that if you're black, you're you're not you don't belong. If you're black, get back. If you're black, you're suspected of being a shoplifter. If you're black, everybody thinks you're a criminal. Okay, so this is the master narrative. 
Uh, if you're black, cops are likely to pull their gun on you and shoot you for no good reason. So if you get pulled over for a speeding ticket, you need to be afraid. You have to train your children about how to handle those situations lest they get themselves executed by murderous police. But there's a narrative. Now, where that narrative comes from, why it is uh, uh, reproduced and reinforced is a question that we could go into. But for right now, I want to say how the existence of such a narrative and the embrace of it colors the way in which people interpret the evidence and the way in which they interpret their experience. They cherry pick their experience in order to foster the narrative. For every microaggressive act that one encounters in interacting with white people, there may be myriad, maybe even hundreds, maybe thousands of non-microaggressive acts. So that if I were a statistician trying to estimate the parameters of the, of the, of the model that I am embedded in of how white people are going to treat me, based on the relative weight of the evidence, most cops are polite, uh, most uh, uh, service people actually smile when they say blah, 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 blah. I should probably come to the conclusion that my blackness is a relatively insignificant factor. This is why when people like Roland Fryer actually do systematic statistical examinations of the evidence on questions like discrimination by police, they often find negative results. That is to say, they often do not find statistically significant incidents of discrimination because the relative frequencies are what they are. But when you're in the grip of a narrative, the relative frequencies don't matter. The one experience that affirms the narrative counts way more than 100 experiences that disconfirm the narrative. That's just the psychology of confirmation bias. And the narrative lives on. The narrative reigns. And what that makes me think is if uh, someone like you or I want to counter the narrative, we can't necessarily do it simply by parsing individual circumstances and saying, oh, they weren't as bad as you say they were. They weren't as numerous as you claim that they were. You shouldn't interpret them this way because there are counter interpretations that might be offered. One has to go after the narrative at its root. One has to expose the narrative and offer a counter narrative. OK, so let me and I'll stop. Say one thing about the narrative. The narrative is that America, American capitalism, American politics, American institutions, American corporations, American society, the uh, plurality that put Donald Trump into the presidency at the voting booth and so forth is racist. America is suffuse with white supremacist thinking. Uh, there are the neo-Nazis, but then there are also their sympathizers, and they are very large in number. The ones who are against affirmative action, they are some of the sympathizers. The ones who have questions about Black Lives Matter or about Colin Kaepernick, they are among the sem America is bankrupt. That's part of the narrative. America is problematic. There's a counter to that. When Martin Luther King actually wanted to change America, what did he do? He embraced America, at least in its ideal form, and insisted that actual America live up to the ideal. He affirmed America from Thomas Jefferson onward. Thomas Jefferson <coughs> is not just the father of Sally Hemings' children. He's also a former president of the United States to whom a monument stands in, uh, on the Potomac, uh, who was the author of the, uh, of the Declaration of Independence and was a significant uh, 18th century figure in terms of the intellectual evolution of the Enlightenment and its instantiation in the institutions of American government. Can we embrace the ideal of Thomas Jefferson or Abraham Lincoln? Uh, you make a, a film about um, how, the, uh, how the 13th Amendment ended up being proposed and enacted. And uh, you, do you paint Lincoln as the great liberator? Or do you paint Lincoln as a morally ambiguous figure who, for political pragmatism, did what he had to do, but in fact was no different, really, than the rest of the racist structures of American society. Some in the South were slaveholders, some in the North <coughs> were collaborators with slaveholders, and Lincoln fits somewhere in the middle. Do you idealize and embrace Lincoln or, or what? You know, uh, I'll stop. But you see what I'm getting at? I'm getting at the narrative, the narrative that America is somehow racially bankrupt versus a narrative that um, abolition actually succeeded through the Civil War in destroying slavery. Jim Crow actually got buried between uh, 1940 and 1970 by a world historic uprising of uh, sympathetic endorsement of fundamental principles of the equality of people regardless of their race. Uh, the uh, social economic circumstances of African Americans circa 1940, where most were employed as farm laborers or domestics, was completely revolutionized, and notwithstanding the existence of pockets of poverty in our country today, there's a huge black middle class. We're the richest people of African descent on the planet, okay? There's a counter-narrative, 
And I'll stop unless we're willing to articulate the counter narrative and to forcefully pose it as an alternative to the uh, narrative of uh, du jour. We're never going to win by uh, parsing Starbucks and swimming pool incidents. Uh, I get you, Glenn. <laughs> I get you, but I don't know. I don't know. I think you uh, you underestimate how much of the the racism there is out there. You know, that's what <laughs> that's what the answer is to a lot of what you're saying. And I agree with what you're saying, but I have a complementary counter narrative because you know you're going to have that person looking over your shoulder, not quite looking you in the eye and telling you that you underestimate the amount of racism as if that's the crucial thing. The crucial thing is this. Yes, there is racism out there, person, you know, counter narrative. Yes. Now tell me why you think that's so important. And just pause. Now, a lot of them are going to say, you know, well, because, you know, microaggressions, it chips away at you. And we're saying, no, it doesn't. No, I'll be just fine if somebody doesn't give me a cup of coffee. I'll be fine. So why else are you so deeply committed to identifying the racism that's out there? Yes, it's there. We all know it. Why is that so important? And just wait for them to come up with an answer and notice that often it's a kind of sputtering. The religious commitment to identifying that racism is still there, even though nobody's burning crosses, is it's tacit, but it's powerful. And I think people have forgotten why it's so important other than just to show that they're good people. Do you want to identify the racism because you think it's an obstacle to black success? Because frankly, the case for that is rather weak in many cases. Are you talking about institutional racism? Because if so, then that's different from Starbucks and the swimming pool. What is it that you think that we're missing, sir? And I think that um, you have to break bread with people like this. This idea that you know that racism exists. Coleman Hughes, for example, who yeah. you had talk with. He and I are, of course, in contact, and we will stay in contact. And um, I told him the other day, I said, Coleman, what you need to realize when you write is that if you want to reach people beyond conservatives yeah. and the already convinced, you have to make sure to do a certain genuflection. Somewhere early in your piece, you have to make sure that you say that you know racism exists and give an example and don't make it just one sentence. And I said about two thirds of the way through, you have to say that again. And I said, I know that you think that everybody knows that you know racism exists and you're gonna use the space to make more interesting points. But frankly, they don't know that. And actually, a lot of your readers are waiting to see that you don't know that racism still exists because I said, you think that what they're thinking is, what does he have to say? And I said, no, you have to remember that for an awful lot of people, what they're thinking first is, does he know racism exists? No matter what your topic is, they're thinking, does he know racism exists? And if it looks like you don't, I told him, they're not going to read you. They're not going to listen. Their minds are shut down. I said, it may feel a little stupid to you to have to always say, you know, that racism exists, but you have to do that little genuflection to be heard in the America, the reading America that we live in. And he listened. And I, I hope he did because I think that his pieces are very good, except that I think he, like me, when I started, I had the same issue in the beginning. I didn't know I needed to say that. I used to give talks where, you know, for the first couple of years, black audiences did not like me. You know, I had people practically hissing at me, the sort of thing you remember. And I remember thinking, I'm not saying anything all that weird. And then around 2002, I realized, oh, wait a minute. I have to say that I know that racism exists. And I learned that once I do that and make a little joke, then people breathe. And then you can say some other things, but you've so got to. Coleman didn't push back. I think Coleman, accept, Coleman accepted your advice without protest. I'm surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I would have expected he may not to want say, to hear our advice, you know, but, uh, uh, that's unreasonable. Why do I have to uh, genuflect and, and pose and posture? This is, this is about true. argument, not about this. That's ad hominem. That's like saying my argument is wrong if I'm not the right kind of person. And as a philosopher, I object. That's what I would have expected from him. Yeah, and unfortunately, people are human. And if you want people to open up, you have to deal with the realities of the ideology. And one of them is that there's this commitment, not to proving that God exists, but something quite analogous, which is racism is still there. So you have to do that. I, I shouldn't give this away because it's in a lot of my pieces. I wrote a piece about Black English um, last week for The Atlantic, where oh, I Oh, yeah, said, I want you to talk about that piece. Sorry to interrupt, John, but uh, please, uh, can you... Uh 
set the stage for that because this has to do with the Nation magazine's uh, apology for publishing a poem by a, a, a Scandinavian. Uh, poet. Kulski, yeah. Yeah, please yeah. describe to the uh, viewing audience what that controversy is about and, and, and offer your uh, analysis. And <clears throat> he is a white male who wrote a 14 line poem taking the position of a black homeless person who is saying that the white passersby who this person, I take it that the person is a woman, is asking for money, dehumanize her. And she's kind of giving advice to maybe another homeless person as to how to get money from people who don't see you as human. And he's putting himself in the mind of that person. That person he has using some black English as opposed to standard English out of the idea that that person most likely would have a comfort in black English dialect, which they certainly would. And for whatever it's worth, the black English is accurate and they kind of switch between black English and standard within the same sentence, which is what black people who speak black English do. And there was a big uproar that the poem was minstrelish, that Anders Carlson Wee had no right to write in the dialect because it's not his dialect because he's white. And that for him to have the person speaking that way borders on blackface. And as a result, the nation's poetry editors, they didn't withdraw it, but they wrote an apology for it where they claimed that they had hurt a great many people in publishing this poem and that they apologized for it. And various people chimed in saying that it was wrong. Um, Roxanne Gay, the New York Times. Oh, she, told, um, she told him to really. stay in his own lane, didn't what did no, you? Know your lane. Know your <laughs> I wrote a piece in the Atlantic where I just said, frankly, the black English is accurate. And I think that we need to get past the idea that when a non-black person writes something in black English, it automatically qualifies as minstrelese and that the appropriation argument, the cultural appropriation argument is weak, that we ask white people to understand our pain. But then if they're artists, one way they're gonna demonstrate that they understand it is by channeling it through their art but then we say, no, you can't use the language because it's not yours. And I said, I'm not sure what we get. And I wanted to say that in that piece, and I shouldn't reveal how the sausage is made, but in that piece, in about paragraph three, I write, now, minstrelese was real. It's definitely true that 100 years ago when white people wrote black people speaking was in this exaggerated language, etc. Now, frankly, I don't think I needed to write that. That is not what I originally wrote in my very first draft. But then I thought, no, I have to genuflect and say, yes, there were minstrel shows. This is the way it was in the past, which we all know. Because for certain readers, if I don't say that, they're not going to read past the beginning because I have to show that I know that racism exists or existed, that genuflection. And then about two thirds of the way through, I mentioned minstrelese again. You have to. As far as I'm concerned, it's a little cynical, but in order to get people to read the meat of the piece, I have to do that. But yeah, that was an unusual controversy. I right? think I disagree with you, John, although I have no good reason to disagree with you. <laughs> because my experience is entirely consistent with your argument. You have to do this if you want people to listen. If you don't do it, they'll never get past the first line and they'll dismiss you out of hand. But the yep. reason I think I may disagree is because we're embedded within a regime in which there's a master narrative. and Given the master narrative, yes, you have to do the things that you're saying. But the master narrative is itself not to be taken for granted and, and, and uh, potentially able to be subverted. Okay, so what do I mean by that? I shared with you, maybe you saw this piece uh, in the Atlantic um, about Jordan Peterson. Mm -hmm. Why is the left so afraid of Jordan Peterson? Uh, who is the author of that piece? Uh, um, that was written by Caitlin Flanagan. It was written by Caitlin Flanagan. And she goes yeah. through analyzing how people have been reacting to Jordan Peterson's uh, book, 12 Rules for Life, and to his celebrity on uh, the internet and so forth. And uh, says that, in effect, the left is afraid of Jordan Peterson because the left stands on very shaky ground on many of their cultural tropes and. Um, uh, uh, taken for granted suppositions about culture and politics. Uh, they stand on shaky ground. So, for example, they overplay their hand on the transgender issue because anybody who is, you know, slow to embrace the idea of, uh, of gender fluidity and, and uh, non binariness or whatever it is must be a bigot. They're transphobic and therefore must be written out of polite society. 
And that simply won't stand that particular posture as an argument or or uh, this is not what she's saying. This is what I'm saying. Elizabeth Warren gives a speech to a black audience in which she announces, declares that the criminal justice system is racist from front to back. From the police officer on the beat to the jury, to the prison guard, to everybody, they're, they're racist. They're racist from front to back. A lot of people are saying, well, that's one narrative. Another narrative is that blacks are vastly overrepresented amongst the people who commit crimes in this country. They're violent. They're bugging people and robbing people. And uh, unfortunately, for whatever the reasons are, disproportionately, they're black. I'm, I'm supposed to uh, uh, chalk that up to racism and not put any responsibility on the people who are doing these acts and so forth and so on. A lot of Asians are thinking, I can't get into Harvard with perfect uh, test scores and a black kid who's uh, a mediocre in comparison uh, gets in with ease. How is that fair? And they're being told a story about how it's fair that they're not buying. We could go on in this vein. Um, and so the foundational narrative sits on shaky ground. We can compromise with it, as you suggest. You see, I know that there's racism in America, but I want you to hear me out. Or we can give it the finger. I'm not going to bend over and uh, uh, meet you halfway on something that's stupid. I'm going to call it stupid and move on. That's pretty much what Jordan Peterson has done with respect to some of the issues that are very important to people on the left. And that, says Caitlin Flanagan, is why they hate him, why they have to destroy him, why his best-selling book doesn't get him invited on Good Morning America or the Today Show to discuss it, and why, and I have to confess this, my son and I and my, my two sons, Glenn and Nehemiah, and I have a book club. Every couple of months, we read a book and we discuss it. And I suggest the 12 Rules of Life, and it got vetoed by my uh, the 30-year-old, uh, soon-to-be 30-year-old gay son. He's a wonderful kid. And he said, I ain't reading no damn Jordan Peterson. He's a <laughs> and I said, come on, man, let's just take a look at the book and find out what it's about. They sold a gazillion copies. The guy's making arguments. They, they could be wrong arguments, but when we look... And he said, no, 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 this guy's beyond the pale. He's on the line. And then he recited uh, several things. Like he claims that Jordan Peterson wants to force people into monogamous relationships, which apparently is not actually, according to Caitlin Fang and what Jordan Peterson actually says and so on and so on. But I'll stop. The left stands on shaky ground. We can split the difference with them if we want and therefore be more acceptable at the editorial pages. Or we can denounce them for what they are. As bang Here's another thing that Jordan Peterson says, and I'll stop. I know I'm going on. He says that the colleges are so profoundly corrupt because of political correctness and because of the bias in curriculum, in the humanities especially. Uh, and yet they take these kids' money. It's a lot of money. Kids go into debt that they can't get out of via bankruptcy and whatnot. So it's almost like involuntary servitude. And they don't educate these kids. Uh, they don't get them to read the classics because the kids say, I don't want to read no dead white males. And so we don't uh, force them. Uh, they are, uh, you know, the sciences and engineering are perfectly good places, but once you get away from that, it's, it's a lot of postmodern, it's double talk, and kids deserve better than that and whatnot. And, and he's furious. Now, you and I both live in these environments. I've been practicing your advice for years, which is to say, I begin every conversation with, I agree, I agree, I agree, but, okay? Mm -hmm. But there's another posture that you can take, which is the corruption, uh, fecklessness, and inanity that are so far afoot in the Afro-American studies departments and the gender studies departments and hell, the American studies departments and the history departments of so many of these universities. You people live in a bubble. You've lost complete touch with reality. Uh, your theoretical musings bear little no relevance to what's actually happening in the world. You're not educating our children. You're poisoning their minds and they come out unable to think except to spout rhetoric and uh, fashionable ideology. Um, uh, you deserve contempt. You don't deserve to be reasoned with and uh, bargained with. I'm not going to bargain with you. I'm going to express my contempt in an unalloyed and direct fashion, you know, like that. So that I, I, I sometimes find myself drawn to this, uh, you know, furious uh, uh, the posture of fury and contempt rather than thinking, I want to remain viable. Let me make sure people know that I embrace the right values. Yeah, I know what you mean, but wow, Glenn, these people are, they're a priesthood. And let's face it, there's a power that they have. You know, they are, they are at the top of the op-ed pages. They determine, you know, where people like you and me can publish things. 
They, as you know, run our universities. They determine who gets in. They determine what kind of classes can be taught. And, you know, they're at the parties that we go to. They are the people who I meet in my neighborhood in Queens. There are certain assumptions, such as, for example, that Caitlin Flanagan is the devil. You know, in many circles, if you're talking about thoughts on women's issues, she's thought of as just this horrible, clueless person for articles, which I've always found to just be lightly challenging, you know, centrist pieces. But you say Caitlin Flanagan in some rooms and everybody just jumps and throws their drinks. And it's not fair, but you can't change it by telling people that they're fools. We don't like being told that we're fools. And the people in general are not fools. I think that more and more it's that they've been instructed in maybe two or three basic tenets, which fall apart if you actually examine them. And I think that's a lot of the whole Jordan Peterson phenomenon, that he is teaching a certain kind of mostly fanboy to think for themselves. And, yeah, he's kind of sinister. And I had a little encounter with him at Aspen. Where I saw it, John. You were, you were splendid, I, yeah. John. You asked him, how does he know? How does That's he all know? I, I know? I want people to understand what you did in that, and you can elaborate. You asked him, you said, uh, uh, some of the people who come before us and insist on being called uh, by a pronoun other than he or she, want to be mm-hmm. called they or whatever, are mm-hmm. genuinely in pain and need to be recognized in their pain and mm-hmm. can, should be accommodated out of basic human decency, and others are playing a card. They're manipulative. They're, they're simply seizing the moment to be able to force you to do a certain thing. How do you know which or which? You're a psychologist. You claim to have a scientific basis for the things that you do. Tell us how you know. Damn good question, John. <laughs> I, had, I was enjoying myself. That really <laughs> only happened. I was one of many people in the audience. And Corby Cummer, the Atlantic writer, we were sitting together and he got me the microphone because I was saying to him, this guy needs to be asked a real question. I didn't know that it was going to be me and that I was going to do that. But, yeah, I just wanted to know, how do you know? I would be interested to know, how can you tell whether a person like that is sincere or not? Because he had claimed that his psychological training gave him techniques to know. That sounded interesting to me. Yes, a little bit of me suspected that he had no such technique, but I was thinking if there is one, I wouldn't mind. You know, I'm in the same environment, and I now and then I get the feeling that some of these students are trying on an identity or you know, trying to shock the bourgeois. How can you tell? Because my general policy is just to accept all of them and give them what they want, because why not? And I can't see into their brains. I wanted to know. And it's very interesting, him and his followers, because this got discussed on Twitter and Facebook much more than I expected. Everybody gets caught up. It's kind of like getting caught up in Starbucks as opposed to the general phenomenon. Everybody's caught up in the fact that technically he's saying he will not follow a law to the effect that he has to use pronouns like this. Now, if you're a legal scholar, et cetera, I suppose that's interesting. But that's not what I asked the man. Uh, And he, he tried to talk about that. And I kept trying to hold his feet to the fire. How can you tell? And he didn't give an answer, which surprised me because... I thought he would be prepared to give a real answer. You get the feeling that he's used to basically saying the same 12 or 13 things over and over. He could have given a better answer and he didn't. But that kind of person who's basically trying to cut through the Kant, cut through these tenets, there's a reason he's so popular. And I don't think that it can be discounted. And it's part of what I mean that something's happening because the people who like Jordan Peterson, I guess some of them are Charlottesville marchers, but it's not the vast majority. These are centrist, often left sure. people who just are tired of things not making sense. There's a there, there's a moment. So yeah, that's what's that's what's going on. But no, I I'll, I'll tell you, play. I actually read Twelve Rule, or I listened to it in the car as I was driving back from North Carolina uh, to Providence uh, earlier in the summer. Um, it's damn good. <laughs> I bet it is. It's very powerful. It's 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 very well written. It's very forceful and direct. And it's a self-help book, and as self-help books go, it's it's not at all bad. I mean, the 12 rules made, you know, the first one is stand up straight with your shoulders back, and then he goes on as to what he means by that. And he goes through a lot of other stuff besides, and, you know, some of it made uh, made sense to me, and I'm not a I'm not an alt-right fanboy uh, over here. Right. Uh, but yeah. he did dodge you. He did dodge you, and he ended up, uh, rather than being the cognitive uh, parsing of uh, discriminating amongst people making certain claims on you because you have insight into their motives, it became the, I'm not going to let the state tell me what words to say, free speech mm-hmm. defense, which was not what you were asking him about. So I, I, but you, Glenn, one last thing I want to say to illustrate something yeah. that you and I have both been talking about. Aspen is one thing I did this summer, 
And I did another Aspen-like thing in, um, in Wales about two months ago. And it's interesting at these things where most of the people asked are white. And then they have some black people giving, you know, usually views about issues related to race. And actually in both of these cases, I said, I'd rather not talk about race, especially since I thought the politics of these things are places where my thoughts about race are generally not welcome. I said, let me be happy linguist. And that worked in both cases. But it's interesting at these events, you talk about how you, what people think of you. At both of these events, I was not the only black American pundit type there. And at both of these events, there were one or two people like that who didn't speak to me at all. And I wasn't hurt because frankly, I didn't speak to them either. But for example, at Aspen, it's this wonderful sunny event where everybody's meeting everybody and the food is good and the yeah. sun's always shining and there's no dirt and there's no germs. Yeah. Everything is just happy. But at, the, at Aspen, I'm not even gonna name who they were and I'm gonna avoid doing gender, but there was a relatively prominent person I've been on panels on MSNBC with this person where we were cordial, but you could see a certain look in yeah. their eye. And just based on the sorts of things I've said, it's clear that this person, you know, from the way that person would say hello to me backstage, oh, hi, John. It's clear that I'm just, I'm no good because of losing the race, et cetera, et cetera. And at this Aspen event, I must say, I didn't walk over to them, but they clearly saw me and they did not walk over to me for four whole days because they hate me, you know, and that's because of how they feel about somebody who does not espouse the tenets. So that's what we're trying to. Does it hurt, John? It it honestly, it honestly doesn't. I mean, I'm not social enough a person to care. I mean, they hate me. It's fine. I know that they're wrong and I have other things to do. But if we're going to get through to people, we have to remember that somebody like that hates us. It's it, it, it's something that often can't be cut through at all. Okay. And there were people, very quickly, there were people walking up to them who thought that they were just wonderful. And I remember thinking, you know, if you like that person, you're gonna have trouble with my stuff. And if I'm gonna get you to understand me, I have to throw you a bone. That's what I'm saying. I got you know. it. I got. I want the audience to understand that I was not blowing a kiss to you. My wife was <laughs> on her way out the door. <laughs> I assumed that it was her. Yes. <laughs> not that you aren't kissable, John. <laughs> I, every now and then, I'll I got to ask you something. Uh, you 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 ducked the Pangburn philosophy uh, affair that's coming up in the fall in New York City. Oh yeah. Uh, I assume you were invited because you you know you're, you're the man. Yeah, uh, I didn't duck it. Uh, what what accounts for our different decisions in that regard? I can tell you why I I accept it. Oh, uh, you tell me why you reject it. Two reasons. One, I don't particularly like panels because you know you you have to go be somewhere and you get to say two or three things. Okay, and uh, it's just it's not enough. So I don't love panels. I do them though. Um, Another problem is oral for me is not as good as writing. You know, with the exception of this, I'd rather write. And I'm learning that talking today is what it is and writing is antique. But that night is going to be about talking. And then it's gone, except it's going to be yeah. online. And also, to be honest, Glenn, and I've, you know, I've seen the response to who's going to be at that event and what some people are saying about it, talking about throwing people a bone. I'm not interested in being typed that way yeah. you know if that's gonna that puts you into a certain group and it's not that that group is a bad group but uh, you know the main reason i turned it down that's what i because, thought it was you know it's just too much but mainly it's it's too many people and i wouldn't really get to say much of anything and so what's the point i'd rather read a book that was the main thing i told them yeah then i said the only way that I would do something like that possibly is if Glenn Lowry were there. And then they said, well, he is going to be there. And then I said, no, but still. And I thought afterward that group, you know, I, I'm not part of a mob. I think Thomas I Chatterton Williams is going to be there. I think they're going to have Coleman Hughes as well. I'm not sure if there'll be other African-American participants. The subject will be about race. Why did you? I think why? Jordan Peterson may be there, actually. Um, Well, the reason I did it, to be honest with you, is that I'm intrigued by this intellectual dark web phenomenon. Yeah. And I I, uh, don't know where, if at all, uh, is my place within that constellation, but I think that I may have one. Uh, and I'm I'm uh, older than you, John, and uh, less concerned less concerned about maintaining my my viability within the system, and more interested, perhaps I don't know. You can correct me if I mischaracterize you in exploring the edges. And and 
I'm, I'm looking for a home to a certain degree. This might not be it. Not, maybe it, this is not it. Uh, but I thought I'd give it a shot and, and, and I'd see. Um, oh, oh, now I remember. I'm putting myself in the frame of mind that I was in then. Scratch everything that I said. Okay. That I was making all that up. The reason I decided not to do that event was because I thought what this really is, is smart white people talking about race, which is fine, but there would only be one or two black people. So most of it would be what they thought about race. And I thought we're being invited because we're black, but that doesn't taste good to me. I, I, they can't help it. They need to have some black people. But I thought, I, I don't want to go to something where I'm invited because I'm black when really most of the conversation is going to be white guys talking about race. I just felt I'd rather be home reading a book than participate in that. So, and I don't even, that word participate is wrong. It's not that I think people are going to be looking at it and thinking, oh, he's evil because he's on stage with X, Y, or Z. It's just, that's not how I want to spend that evening because mostly it would be you and me and Coleman listening to them talking about race. Why don't they just have the conversation themselves? And then they invite us because we have unique views because we're black or is it they need to have some black people so that they don't get called racist? You know, I've participated in that to an extent. Yeah. I was at the Manhattan Institute for that reason. But I just didn't feel like doing it that night. Well, I respect that, John. I, I certainly do. And I think you're probably right that there's an element of what you describe if it's not the whole thing. My attitude toward it is to put all the cards on the table, including that card. You know, I, I can remember. I mean, I've been around for a while, as you know, so I can remember back to the days of the Reagan administration and whatnot, when I was one of the few black conservatives going out there saying certain things. Yep. And I'd get invited to a conference and I'd say, I know why I'm here. I'm here because I'm the <laughs> black person who's getting ready to say this. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. I'm saying to the conservatives, I want you to think about that <laughs> for a minute because I'm nobody's mascot. Do you hear me? I'm a man. OK. And when I insist upon that, uh, upon the independence that comes along with that, um, I want you to respect that. Uh, I, you know, uh, don't patronize me. I'm not your mm. pet. Kind mm -hmm. of thing like that. And I think it would be interesting to see how um, a Jordan Peterson or a, a Joe Rogan or um, uh, an Eric Weinstein or a Brett Weinstein would respond to uh, that kind of uh, positioning by an mm -hmm. African-American contrarian, someone who accepts that the uh, political correctness on some of the race issues has run amok, somebody who wants to push back against a lot of the social justice warrior, racial justice uh, warrior, uh, Black Lives Matter stuff, but who's still an independent, self-respecting, autonomous, thinking for himself, nobody's pet, African-American. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny, I haven't thought about that event in a while. But yes, one does wonder about those things. I just, um, there are times now where I just am not interested in going to effort to do something where I'm being asked because of the color of my skin, even if it's for a justifiable reason. I feel reduced and they have, they couldn't do otherwise. They have to invite black people and they should. And sometimes I bend. You know, like it's okay if it's you and me, or if it's an event where there's a reason. Some of the things with Heterodox Academy, yeah, not not in general, where I'm there, and it's not because of what I know about language. It's not because of yeah, I hear you know, any. I, hear you. I just it just doesn't it doesn't taste good, and that's no knock on them. But you know, let me make an observation because at that Aspen event, which anybody can find online if they search for you and uh, Jordan Peterson or whatever, uh, and it's worth people's time. It was moderated by Barry Weiss. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the uh, writer for the New York Times. And when you were recognized with the microphone in the audience, I wasn't there. You were way back somewhere. She could barely see you. But her body language and voice inflection changed. Oh, and I realized <laughs> you guys have a personal relationship. She really likes you. <laughs> I mean, no, I know what you mean. Friendly relationship. Yes. <laughs> Mary, Mary and I are very friendly. And, um, you know, it's sad the sort of stuff she goes through. But yes, yes, she and I like each other. And we've, we've, we've co-hosted a radio show with Stephen Dubner. Oh, about, I see. Back in December. So yes, Barry and I, Barry and I are very Kima Sabi. You know, actually, before I go and I have to run, it was very interesting at the event after that, which is not recorded. Caitlin Flanagan, Jordan Peterson, Barry Weiss, me, Corby Cummer, and um, Yasha Monk 
all fr from sleep. We're all at the bar kind of drinking for a while. It was a very interesting interaction. And it occurred to me that me being seen with most of those people in many circles, including where I work, would be seen as highly sinister. You know, what's wrong with him dealing with the evil Barry Weiss and Caitlin Flanagan and Jordan Peterson? And yet all of these are perfectly reasonable human beings. Yeah. But, you know, nobody will ever know. You know, the, the religion keeps people from thinking about it. It's a shame. But yes, it was a very nice Aspen. I loved Aspen. But I didn't go to Aspen as a Negro. And that was part of why I enjoyed it. And so, you know, here we are. All right, Jack. Anyway, I've, I've got to run. And yeah, so I understand. We've, uh, we we've been in our time. We've uh, had a conversation. We, there are other things to talk about. We'll get to them in due course. I'm on my way to Toulouse, south of France, September 1st, for six Whoa. weeks, John. Wow. Yeah. Uh, maybe we'll talk again here before I go. Maybe not. But even so, you know, the Internet works transatlantic. Yeah, I'm going to be a visiting, distinguished visiting professor at the Institute for Advanced Study in Toulouse uh, and at the Toulouse School of Economics. Um, and this is one of the most distinguished uh, institutions of uh, high level economic research in Europe. They got wow. Nobel laureates walking the corridors <clears throat> around there and stuff. They got uh, very serious young scholars. They've got a, a postdoctoral program with several dozen uh, young investigators in the social sciences from all over North Africa and the Middle East and Asia, as well as from Europe. One in six of their postdocs is French. Most of them are from other parts of the world. I'm going to give a series of lectures and hang out, me and my lovely wife, and uh, we're going to tour the Riviera, and we're going to get to... Uh, maybe Algiers or someplace like that, if it can be safely done, uh, get to the Italian Alps or whatever it is. We're going to have a good time. You know, in that part of the world, I saw some of the most beautiful human beings I have ever seen. I would just go. I was at a conference there. I would just go to cafes and sit and not really order much just to watch people going by. And that includes coal black Africans as well as blonde white people. Everybody was so pretty. I envy <laughs> you just to be able to look at all those people because it's not like that where I live as much. So, no, that sounds fantastic. It's got to be great. I've, I've got to go out into the heat. I have an appointment. And so, all um, right. people talk. We will. Take care of yourself. You too. Bye.